tradition has deep roots here at Pensacola, Florida. Some reach back centuries. Others, such as the tradition of naval aviation, are relatively young at not quite 60 years of age. One tradition is particularly significant at Pensacola's Naval Air Station. It's a tradition known as the Blue Angels. A fantastic aerial ballet, precision maneuvers executed with quick and easy grace. A melding of aviator skills and the performance of high-speed jet aircraft. This is how the Blue Angels tradition is seen in the sky. Like many traditions, it started with a mission. The year was 1946. As representatives of the United States Navy, the newly formed flight demonstration team was directed to demonstrate the tactical techniques of naval aviation. Their role was to augment the Navy's recruiting programs by stimulating interest in the United States Navy. Thus, they could aid in the procurement of naval aviators and aviation personnel and promote morale in the naval service. To date, a hundred million people have witnessed their demonstration and know the team affectionately as the Blue Angels. On the ground, the Blue Angels tradition is seen as a closely knit team of 10 officers and 90 enlisted men, all regular career Navy. For each team member, this tour of duty is a two-year investment helping to build and maintain the Blues tradition. It's hard work being a Blue, for the pilots practice every day, practice, and more practice. For the maintenance crews, it's a constant cycle of preparation, practice, and preparation. This game has two names. This is where both are accomplished. Naval Air Station Pensacola, home of the Blue Angels. The care and feeding of modern supersonic jet fighters is a full-time job. To the crews who maintain the Blue Angels aircraft, preparation is a goal of peak performance at all times. And tradition calls for this task to be done by the finest technicians found in the Navy. The Blues team has all the required service ratings and job descriptions, plus the caliber of skill expected of men carefully selected from a long list of volunteers. The fierce pride of achievement felt by the Blues is reflected in the unique decor of their home base environment. Blue Angel, Lieutenant Russell. This is also a place yes, for hard sir. work. In these offices are carried out all the routine tasks of Naval Unit Administration, plus special tasks imposed by the team's special mission. At certain moments in time here at Pensacola, the end results of practice and preparation come closer to fulfillment. All elements of the Blue Angel team are mustered, men and machines. They are leaving home base for a flight demonstration. It happens about 80 times per year. A hundred different pilots have sat in briefing sessions like this one since the Blues were formed. Each is a regular Navy or Marine officer, 26 to 36 years of age, and a highly qualified jet pilot. Each has undergone an exhaustive selection process to become a Blue Angel. Together, they contribute a wealth of special experience to the Blue Angel tradition. There is flight instructor experience here, duty at Naval Advanced Jet Flight Schools, where they helped write the book on precision maneuvers. There is also combat experience here, carrier operations with the fleet in Southeast Asia, interdiction and strike missions over Vietnam's jungles. And to all these former duty assignments, they will return when their Blue Angels tour is over. Right now, the briefing is for a peaceful mission. So we're going to have to take a good look at the field when we get there. Make a standard walk down and be a far type takeoff. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is a typical showcase for the Blue Angels flight demonstration. It could be a small airfield in rural America, a military base, 
or one of the free world's major international jet airports. Despite the holiday atmosphere, this is tradition on display. Those of you in the front rows can see the military manner in which our six demonstration pilots have walked down are approaching their assigned aircraft and have been saluted by their respective plane captains and first mechanics. In a few moments after a conference with the maintenance personnel, the pilots will man up these F-4Js to begin today's flight demonstration. All six pilots have manned up their aircraft now. Their crew chiefs are assisting and strapping them into these F-4J Phantom jets. Very shortly, our Blue Angel ground crew will begin starting a small auxiliary power unit that will in turn start our Phantom. Watch as pilots and ground crew team up to check all the very important components of these Phantoms before they give the final thumbs up and taxi out to begin the flight demonstration. down the runway from the right for the diamond takeoff. Our lead solo pilot, as he runs his engine to full power, and now at 170 miles an hour, pulls the nose of his aircraft into the air, and with a gear and flap still extended, rolls his aircraft 360 degrees with the gear and flaps down. Very spectacular dirty roll on takeoff. Going to number six. Raising the gear and flaps without allowing the aircraft to climb. The acceleration out on the runway. Now pulling back on the stick, climbing straight up. Allowing those two General Electric J79 engines that power these aircraft to drive his F4J straight up now as he performs the element on takeoff. The Blue Angel pilots are justly proud of the formation they fly. It's considered the tightest of any flight demonstration team in the world. Complete wing overlap with only 36 inches separating the wingtips from the canopy. The diamond formation. Off to the right now, about a half mile. See if you can see what's unusual about this diamond formation. As Commander Weed brings them across the field from the right, the Farbel formation. The leader, Commander Bill Weed, is upside down. On the left, 400 degrees per second, horizontal roll. Back in the basic diamond formation, complete wing overlap, only inches. From wingtip to canopy now, as Commander Weed brings them in for the very beautiful diamond roll. Right echelon formation, the wingman's back 45 degrees after the right wing, but watch now as they slide across the echelon, halfway through a roll into tight time. The change over roll. back on the lead aircraft left wing in this tight formation.
four aircraft box formation with the number two aircraft flying line abreast of the leader. They're coming out for the right for the box loop. Watch very carefully halfway through the maneuver as they call for a formation change. Very smooth transition from box to diamond formation at the top of this loop. Full foul returns now from the right, climbing his aircraft nearly straight up. Rolling it once, twice, three times now as he's still climbing, still rolling. right now with his aircraft upside down lead solo pilot he does the outside one half cuban eight a maneuver that we call the blivet on the left now a five aircraft manda formation as they come in now for the florida lead I think we've shown you all here today that these McDonnell Douglas F-4Js handle very well at the high speed we've seen so far. These aircraft flown by thousands of Navy, Marine Corps, and Air Force pilots is one of the most successful fighter aircraft in the free world today. From the right now, the Blue Angel Delta Fluid. demonstration is over. The Blues land as they have performed in tight formation. A performance seldom equaled, never surpassed. Receiving their accolades in person, meeting the public face to face. For the Navy expects each member of the team to represent the service at all times, on the ground as well as in the air. Ambassadors of goodwill wherever the team commitments take them, often inspiring the nation's young men to select a Navy career, and so become future standard bearers of the Blue Angels tradition. Tradition's standard bearers. That's a fitting title for all the people who wear the blues insignia. And the standard they uphold? It's an old tradition, deep-rooted and mellowed by centuries. It's also a contemporary as supersonic flight. A tradition of hard work, a constant striving for excellence, and the knowledge of a job well done. That's the Blue Angels tradition. There is a word for what we are about to see. It's a goal that's in the minds of the Blue Angels each time they perform the difficult art of formation flying. That word is perfection. And to constantly seek perfection is the experience of being a Blue Angel.
How long does it take? <laughs> well, we most of us fly about six years in the military, and once we're selected, we train about four months. How do you guys train to play this? But, you know, every pilot the, the Blue Navy Angels are goodwill ambassadors for the Navy and have entertained millions of people since their beginnings in 1946. Their audiences think of them as men who spend most of their time in the sky. But actually, 90% of the job is done on the ground, meeting people, visiting schools and hospitals, getting involved in the communities they visit. While the Blues meet people before and after the show, it's still the flight demonstration that brings out the crowds. For the Blue Angels, it's the opportunity they want to be able to demonstrate their professionalism as pilots. Like the show? <laughs> <laughs> Miramar Naval Air Station, California, one of the 80 shows the Blues appear in during the season. The crowd is expectant. They know that for the next several minutes, they will be spectators to the ultimate in formation flying. fulfill a mission, to show young people that Navy flying is a professional job, and to encourage them to take up careers in naval aviation, to become Navy pilots, and maybe even to become Blue Angels. into this flight demonstration, day after day in the air, doing it over and over again. The whole idea is to be able to go up every time and fly it perfectly. That's what the Blue Angels are all about. is a study in teamwork, each pilot depending on the skill of the others. Look at this diamond formation, how the planes are pulled in as close as humanly possible. There's complete wing overlap, with only an arm's length separating canopy from wingtip. This is the tightest formation flying you'll ever see.
along with teamwork, you've got to have concentration. There's a lot to lock in your mind. Your position on the leader and the wingman. Your relation to the... This is what it's like to fly with the blues. What they do and the way they do it is something you never tire of watching. A perfect blend of man and machine that is poetry in motion, a ballet in the sky. Blue Angel demonstration builds to a climax with one of their most difficult maneuvers, the Delta Vertical Break. Here is where you face a real test of precision flying. Up you go, to 8,000 feet, and into the front half of a loop, and then you break. All six planes heading toward the six points of the compass. Put up on a mile. You're up to 500 miles an hour. You go into a half Cuban eight reversal turn. Now, all planes are heading back toward the center point, coming from the six points of the compass. If it's right, you'll have that hit effect. All six planes crossing each other at minimum separation. You'll accelerate until you're closing in at a thousand miles an hour. This is it. The six point cross. Live, work, and train with a group of men trying to achieve a goal. And you wait it to happen. That moment when you can say, it was perfect. And that gives you a feeling that you never forget. It's the peak experience we all look for. That's the portrait of the Blue Angel.
forward edge of the runway. No problem, be a little bit longer. Okay. Yes, power. Three, uh, 340. Four, 300. Five, two, eighty. Four, you go, smoke on. A quarter mile. From an almost deserted airfield on the edge of California's great Mojave Desert, a call went out to the top racing pilots of America, a challenge to compete in the first air race of its kind ever held. 66 laps around a 15-mile pylon course, flat out for 1,000 miles with no holes barred, no restrictions on horsepower, size, weight, or modifications. There were only three limiting regulations. Every entry had to be piston-powered, propeller-driven, and have a qualified pilot. The top racing teams of the nation accepted the challenge. From all over America, they came with their sleek aircraft, their brute horsepower. For three punishing days, they qualified and held briefings. Are there any questions on practice or qualifying? Yeah. Is there some possibility of having a fuel truck available in the pit today uh, for alternate pilots uh, so we don't have to taxi all the way back and refuel? Okay. Is there room down on the end of the taxiway there uh, to, to sit out of the way? In other words, we get down, there's too many, can we dog off and wait? Yeah, that's right. Okay, well, that's well. We like every airplane, too, today when you're practicing to make a maximum performance takeoff here because you're going to have to do it in the race. The more practice you can get, the better it's going to be for you. Myriad problems were solved at the briefings that led to the parade to the post of these quarter-century-old war horses. Today's race will be for 1,000 miles, 66 laps around a 15-mile pylon-marked course. This is a first time for a race of 1,000 miles. No four-engine airliner has ever before been entered in such a race. Each pilot faces different problems and plans a different strategy. It'll be about a three and a half hour race, a three hour and 15 minute race, but it's a, it's a checkered flag finish. I mean, everybody finishes when the checkered flag goes. Old airplanes mean continuous problems up to the last minute. If anybody knew of a 51 that wasn't racing, uh, from which I could borrow a canopy. A white airplane. Those are 96s you're putting in there. Right. Those brand new ones you just gave me. We can't go no, non-stop, no way. Listen, I'm electing to stop. I've told the pit I'm going to stop on the 25th lap just for a pilot change. We have to turn inside the pilot because it makes it a little bit tight for the 30. These men are a breed apart. They earn their living in a variety of ways. They are doctors, advertising executives, cowboys, and professional pilots. They fly for the sheer joy of it. I'd like to run takeoffs between 4.30 and 5, practice takeoffs on runway 30. And these multiple aircraft departures are encouraged because comes tomorrow, you're going to have a guy on each side of you or someplace, and let's not run into each other. As the engines roar into life on the starting grid, the pilots settle into their cockpits for a punishing three hours, strapped into two tons of cleverly fashioned metal, hurtling only a few feet off the ground at speeds up to 400 miles per hour. When the green flag goes up, brakes are applied and throttles are eased forward. Tension mounts. When the green flag goes down, the race is on.
Leroy Penhall in P-51 takes the lead immediately, which signals the beginning of a dangerous duel for first place with Bob Love in another P-51. Brown Reynolds' Bearcat slips past Gunther Balls on the straightaway. Bob Love, virtually on the deck, holds the lead for three laps. But the pace is too much. Throttle settings too high. Engine temperatures skyrocket. Love is forced to throttle back. Meanwhile, back in the pack, another battle develops among the multi-engine planes. Wally McDonald's B-26 bomber finds itself in a duel with Gene Aker's single-engine F-4U Corsair. This nightmare at high noon, which pilot Daryl Greenemeyer has dreamed up for a race, has sent cockpit temperatures soaring to the 160-degree mark. Can you read me now? Yeah. Okay, let's switch off the aft tank, go to the auxiliaries, and be sure and use that boost pump. Miss America, give induction temp reading next data leg. Miss America, Greenemeyer is out. Greenemeyer is out of the race. The irony of it all. The first casualty is Daryl Greenemeyer, the man who conceived the race. He's down with a cockpit full of hot oil. Bob Gilford's F4U is in for his first pit stop. <laughs> Meantime, the two wise men of the race, Clay Lacey and Alan Polson, cruise coolly by an airliner comfort. As Metcalf Sea Fury comes in for a pilot change to Lyle Shelf. Uh, your second place, I think, now, Bob. Put him over the back of the You got 33 laps. Exactly half. How much fuel? We got about 40, 30 to 40 left. We got plenty of gas. Yeah. It registers about 30 on the gauge. We'll see right now exactly how it is. You know what? How fast is Sherman going? Real fast. Okay, then you can put on at least 37 inches. Well, that's the break point, I think. Hey! Yeah. Oil can air! Pit stops count for time. Get in and out as fast as possible. Okay, got a screwdriver handy, anybody? Yes, right there. No, let it all spray out. Did you get the oil yet? Huh? Check that. Uh, you gotta check it yet. I gotta check that clamshell actuator. How much pressure do you have? Let's have another fuel hose. Give me another fuel hose. I think it's hot in here. <laughs> You're a little hot, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> if I've got 27 to go. He's going in pit three. You park him, huh? John? Hey, did you get the back of his canopy? Here. You park him. Huh? Idaho cattleman Mike Looning lost time on a long pit stop. This is no tortoise and hare affair. The big one is fast. I see it. Here comes a shadow up by us. Oh, it's Bob Love. He passes on the left. There he goes under us. Yeah, look at that guy go. Boy, he must be about three feet going around a pylon. Right on the deck. Dr. Sherman Cooper has brought off a fast one. He fooled the field by never making his expected pit stop. For three hours, without rest, he has endured murderous physical demands, lapped the field at least twice, flashes home the winner. Cliff Cummings, P-51, roars in a close second, and Mike Loning third. Clay Lacey and Alan Polson, who put an airliner up against the fastest prop-driven fighters, surprised everyone by starting in 20th position and finishing in sixth place. Cooper's Sea Fury had made a magnificent win. Super Snoopy drew a warm-hearted crowd. Owner pilot Alan Polson enjoyed it. How did we come in? Yeah, what did you make? I don't know. I think we beat 14 or 15 oh, people. What did you speak? Oh, we were indicating around 300 knots. <laughs> Your co-pilot always wear glasses. These DC sevens, you know, go pretty fast. The wind's kind of bad in them. <laughs> a great plane. A great pilot. Dr. Sherman Cooper flew a tough, hard race. Which pylon did I cut? Five. Is that right? Congratulations. Boy, I was getting punchy real bad. <laughs> so I thought, well, I'll fly high for a while and see what happens. What did it feel like? 
great. <laughs> Feels good to win. Champagne to hear. Would you like a little champagne? <laughs> right here. Come on, have a little champagne. <laughs> Be a sport. <laughs> That was good, huh? Boy, did you get tired? The first thousand mile unlimited air race is history. More than 30,000 persons witnessed it. Thousands more flocked to the new air shows all over the nation. The era of the piston, the prop, and the pilot has not really been forgotten and now takes on a new and more exciting life, as we shall see in a moment. These two gentlemen may not look like it, but they are performers about to go on stage. They are about to step in front of an audience that is not out front, but rather is almost two miles below. This is the opening act in a modern air show. The scene is Southern California. Today it is an act that is becoming increasingly familiar to all Americans. The air show of today has everything the thrill-seeking audience could desire. It is a compendium of all the spine-chilling acts that stem from the old barnstorming days of early aviation. It brings out the crowds by the thousands. It has all the true flavor of an old-fashioned 4th of July picnic. There are flags and races, hot dogs, brave men, and beautiful women. Only in her 20s, Carolyn Salisbury is the premier ballerina of this air show. Carolyn Salisbury has put as much dedication and study into perfecting her airborne pirouettes as any disciple of the famed Ballet Russe. More than that, she has put her personal treasure into the construction of her specially designed aerobatic Clark's airplane. She bought and paid for it herself. She knows full well what the poet meant when he wrote, I've climbed the skies on laughter silvered wings. When earthbound, Carolyn devotes herself to her work as an x-ray technician. Released from her hospital photographic dark room, she finds an escape in the heavens that has led her to the national second place position among women aerobatic pilots. at the controls of his super steerman, a 600 horsepower brute of an airplane that serves as the mount for a brute of a man who rides it like an aerial cowboy. John Kazian climbs from the front cockpit to the upper wing. As he does so, he fights against a 100 mile an hour wind that seems determined to wrench him loose. Struggling into an erect position against a seemingly frail back support, he takes a position that he will maintain, regardless of the attitude of the airplane. does one take a bow from an airplane? Here's how. <laughs> Carolyn Salisbury again, demonstrating the new sport of paragliding. The car tows her and she flies, like a bird.
50 years ago, this airplane would have been a World War I Jenny. The car would have been an Apperson 8. The act would have been the same. Art Scholl is driving. Roy Sprague is piloting the Piper Super Cub. John Kazian is on the car's hood. Kazian is going to transfer from the car to airplane. Got it. First, he's going to crash through a wall of fire, a wall made of flaming boards that will only give way when his body smashes through at almost 100 miles per hour. Kazian's been a busy man. He had to brush off the flames, climb the rope ladder, haul it up after him before Roy Sprague could land. Top air show stars, John Kazian and Roy Sprague. A specially modified 260 horsepower de Havilland chipmunk roars into the sky. At the controls, Art Scholl, who holds second place among national championship aerobatic pilots. Scholl, a professor of aeronautics at a California college, is thought by many to be supreme in his field. He achieves a mathematical precision in his aerobatic maneuvers, a precision that, in most instances, is the slim margin for him between a stunning exhibition or a flaming death. Joel looks left as he is joined by Skip Volk and another chipmunk. Wing on wing, they climb into a loop. There is no room for error. A miscalculation would spell tragedy. The plane, the prop, and the pilots are as one in this ballet in the heavens. climbs almost vertically to roll out in an Immelman at the top. Perhaps the most dangerous of all acts. Volk rolls inverted to take a canopy to canopy position with Art Scholl. And now, a loop, back to back. No room for error. A Russian team originated this maneuver. They died performing it. Scholl and Volk make it look easy and beautiful. Now, Art Scholl at full throttle builds up speed firm hand with the delicate touch of the artist on the controls. Scholl prepares to thrust his aircraft into a Lumshavak, a maneuver originated in Czechoslovakia. His chipmunk appears to be completely out of control. It tumbles like a broken toy through the sky. Lumshavak means headache. One can see why it was chosen to describe this maneuver. Skip Volk looks up. 
Art Scholl lines up, picks his course carefully. They rush at each other, an intentional near miss. Bolt watches Art Scholl as he enters another tumbling lumshabout. Little wonder that today's air show is a real success. Satisfying the public's demand for excitement and thrills. Provided for them by the combination of pistons, props, and pilots. The pistons and the props are pretty much the same as the barnstormers had, but the pilots are something else. Their skill exceeds the best of yesteryear. 